Thank you. Um, so uh, Steve suggested that I think about the Caltech archives as a wunderkammer for you tonight, and so that's exactly <laughs> what I'm going to do. Um, you can see some of the range of representations of nature, representations of human experience and creativity that you might expect to find in a cabinet of curiosities here on some of our images from our collections. But I'm going to go a bit deeper than that on a few particular ways that the collections of a university like Caltech can themselves represent the variety of nature in the way that early modern cabinets were also meant to do. Um, Caltech itself was founded in 1891 as Troop University, as some of you local here to Pasadena may know, um, and was originally located uh, in then downtown Pasadena, um, now where the Castle Green is. Uh, in fact, in a building that is now part of the Castle Green, still standing. Um, and the Caltech Archives, uh, where I work and where we collect the history of the Institute, was founded 50 years ago in 1968. So we had a bit of catching up to do when we started, uh, and we continue to collect things happening uh, at Caltech now, contemporary research, but also that history going back to 1891 and beyond. And I'm gonna start with the beyond. I'm going to start with some of the history that we have in the Caltech archives that goes back well before Caltech itself. Um, and uh, specifically with the original Copernican Revolution, um, with the uh, period in the 16th and uh, sorry in the 15th and 16th centuries, I'm sorry, 16th and 17th centuries, when um, astronomers debated uh, the place of the Earth in the solar system and the orbits of the planets, um, and of course one of the most famous documents, the most influential document from that time, is Nicholas Copernicus's On the Revolutions of the Heavenly Spheres. Um, all the photographs that I'm showing you, I just took last week um, in our collections. So um, these are things that if you came and visited us, uh, you would be able to see firsthand. Uh, and this is, this is that book. Um, one of the big challenges of Copernicus's work in On the Revolutions for his immediate audience and for audiences for decades and centuries to come was that his sort of ideal presentation of planetary orbits here was a massive oversimplification. Um, those orbits uh, could not be understood by him or by any other astronomer of the time as the simple circles that they appeared to be here because they had all observed planets appearing to speed up and slow down. And uh, in ways that mathematically did not fit this image. So much of the work of the astronomers that followed Copernicus was to make sense of how planets could appear to change in their speeds, change even uh, from some perspectives in the directions of their orbits. And one of the great thinkers in that area was Johannes Kepler, um, writing uh, a couple of generations after Copernicus um, in a number of books but I'm particularly fond of this one, uh, Harmonices Mundi, The Harmony of the Worlds. Um, and I'm fond of it in part because of its wunderkammeriness, um, because of uh, the variety that it encompasses. Um, you can even see just from the, the words that, that look English-ish, right? The cognates in the Latin here in the table of contents, um, words like geometry, harmonics, metaphysics, psychology, astrology, astronomy, metaphysics again, um, uh, there's a, a tremendous range to this book, and although we remember it now um, primarily for its contribution to the understanding of the orbits of the planets, there were a lot of other things going on here. Um, there was an extended discussion of the geometry of regular solids and of their relationship to the four classical elements of earth, air, fire, and water, which you can see depicted here um, in some of the, in some of the, the, the uh, polyhedra themselves. Uh, as well as the relationship of the polyhedra to the quintessence or the somewhat mythical fifth element uh, beyond the four. Um, and uh, in my favorite part of this work, there was an attempt to understand the orbits of the planets through the model of music and even through musical notation. So here you can see um, Kepler is making sense of the speeding up and slowing down of the planets as they circle the sun. And he's making sense of that through the speeding up and slowing down of vibrations of the air that we perceive as music. Um, his harmony of the spheres or harmony of the worlds was very literal. 
um, and was something that he represented through pages and pages of musical notation like this. And it's a harmony that has then been recreated by composers, particularly in the 20th and 21st centuries. So you can find a number of recordings of Kepler's harmonies of the spheres um, as interpreted and arranged by musicians in the more recent past. So this is one way that we can think about our collections as a wunderkammer. We can actually look at points in time when the way that people conceived of nature and of knowledge was as having this indivisible variety, such that you would understand uh, the heavens through music, um, and that these things were part of a single whole way of knowing the world. But we can also look at our collections of Caltech's history, uh, more recent, more disciplined, more structured in the ways that we perceive uh, nature and knowledge. Um, and we can still find various kinds of variety in that recent history. This is um, uh, Troop Hall, which was our original building on our current campus after we were in a couple locations before that. It was built in uh, 1910 and torn down in 1972 following earthquake damage in 1971. So understanding this human history, this architecture of this particular building, involves also understanding the natural history of earthquakes in Southern California. Mostly what we do in the Caltech archives is collect papers, and we have rows and rows of them like this. Um, in the foreground here, uh, you're mostly seeing the papers of theoretical physicist Richard Feynman. Um, and so these boxes have in them letters between scientists, laboratory notebooks, drafts of lectures and articles and other kinds of things, uh, the extent of a life in research beyond what you can see in the published record. We also have in our collections film and video from the 20th century history of Caltech. Um, this is actually a stack of things that we've just digitized, and hopefully over the next week or two we're going to watch them and see what we, what we ended up with. Um, and of course, recent digital media. Uh, this is just a photo from my office to give a sense of the range of formats that are waiting for me to, to sort through them. But I particularly want to share with you our collections of three-dimensional objects, um, of uh, artifacts, of scientific instruments, and other apparatus. Uh, and this is uh, maybe 15 or 20 percent of that collection that you're seeing in this photograph right here. Um, this collection as well ranges across knowledge as it's practiced, created, and experienced at Caltech. So you can see in the foreground some electrical apparatus, um, those round devices. Actually, this is a good occasion for a laser pointer. Is it this one? Yeah. So these, these are a, a voltmeter and an ammeter for measuring uh, electrical current. Um, we have a variety of calculating devices uh, from throughout the 20th century, including this one, which piqued my curiosity because it is a uh, slide rule belonging to Carl Sagan, who was never affiliated with Caltech, so it's not something I expected to find in our collections. Uh, but apparently, uh, uh, the astronomer Carl Sagan, for some reason, uh, gave his slide rule or sold his slide rule, I don't know how that exchange happened, to the theoretical <laughs> physicist Murray Gelman, and it came to Caltech with Caltech physicist Murray Gelman's other possessions. Um, Carl Sagan does have a Pasadena collection, connection as a founder of the Planetary Society, so there's, there's some relationship here, but as far as I know, that's not why we have his slide rule. Um, we also have uh, objects linked to the history of Caltech through uh, many kinds of research done, including, in this case, these rocket heads linked to uh, the early rocketry research that also led to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. This is also a product of aeronautical research at Caltech, although it is a toy car. Um, it is a toy car that was used in our wind tunnel um, alongside experiments in aerodynamics with more uh, exotic shapes for <laughs> aircraft. And um, I want to share this object with you. It might be my favorite in our collection of apparatus, in part because it's so mysterious on first glance. Um, it's a set of test tubes that are connected together uh, by some plastic uh, rods, essentially. And the test tubes can slide against each other. So this piece here can slide down one, and the test tube that's lined up here ends up instead lined up with the next one, um, and so on. Um, 
And this is something that I found on the shelf and wondered about, and it turns out that it is a fly sorter. <laughs> and I'm glad we had a chance to see a fly spanker earlier, so we also have a fly sorter. Um, and the, the uh, functioning of this device is that you, uh, you put some flies in here, um, <laughs> and you shine a bright light on it. And some of the flies really don't like the bright light, and they'll fly as far away as they can to the other end of the test tubes. And some of the flies maybe don't mind it so much, or maybe they're just stunned because you're supposed to put the flies in there with some force, and so maybe they'll stay put. <laughs> And you do that repeatedly, and you end up with a statistical distribution of fruit flies sorted throughout several test tubes, which you can then use to make arguments about the behavior of fruit flies, as uh, physicist turned biologist Seymour Benzer did in his article uh, in which he employed the fly sorter. Um, this then turned into an argument about the genetics of the behavior of the fruit flies and what genes led them to fly away from the light or towards the light or to be indifferent to the light. Um, so it was one piece of uh, a, an elaborate research program, um, but part of that production of understandings of the genetics of behavior was sorting flies by shining bright lights on them. I want to conclude, um, I, in part because we have an exhibit in our own exhibit space at Caltech, um, with a quotation from physicist Richard Feynman about precisely this um, variety of nature and of knowledge that's captured in the idea of a wunderkammer. If, for our, if our small minds, for some convenience, divide this glass of wine, and he's using wine as a, a microcosm of the universe here, this universe into parts to physics, biology, geology, astronomy, psychology, and all, remember nature doesn't know it, so we should put it back together and not forget at last what it is for. Let it give one final pleasure more. Drink up and forget about it all. Thank you. <laughs>